basic principles and laws of a nation. And we're talking about the constitution as it pertains to the kingdom uh, study, as it, pertains, as it pertains to the image of the king. Now, remember I've told you before, and I'll just rehash it just for those who are viewing, this is your first broadcast. And so what you have to understand is this, the, the, the law that we're talking about, we're, we're really talking about the law of God. So when we use the terminology, terminology, the image of the king, what are we talking about specifically? Well, what we're specifically talking about is the inherent in a law, the natural law that governs all of humanity. And so let me make that more specific. In the Old Testament, the word statue comes up multiple times. Statues, keep my statues, keep my statues. Well, statues is the image of God. It's, it's, it's where we're able to get the image of God. So when God created us in his image and in his likeness, and then he told us to have dominion, um, he also, we, we also begin to understand that the word image now is translated into the word statue. So God gave us, after the fall of Adam, God now gives us statues. The statues now are, are the image of God duplicated. Now, it's going to make really a lot of sense as I go over this today. And I'm just going to give you a lot of scripture today as we're doing the introduction to this. And then next week, we're going to really go deeper into this. It's like, okay, so I'm, I'm really excited. So as y'all can see, I'm all over the place right now, but we're going to get it together. All right. So what we have to begin to understand is that the statues of God give us back the image of God. So then the laws of God actually become the become the law i mean become the images whereby we predicate the actual image that we were creating so let me simplify that in other words the statues of god is the law of god uh or the image of god the image of god gives us the portrait of god the portrait of god now is is exemplified in the laws of god so let's go in reverse if i keep the law of god i am walking in the portrait of god if i'm walking in the portrait of god i'm actually walking in the image i'm mean, in in the statues of god if i'm watching walking in the statues of god i am walking in the image of god let me simplify that even more law is image image is law. So um, when I begin to do the laws of God or the laws of Christ, I'm actually walking in the image of what he created me to be. Amen. Now let's look at this again. Constitution, write this down. The basic principles and laws of a nation, state, or kingdom, a social group that, uh, a social group that uh, demonstrates Oh, I'm sorry, social group that determines the powers and duties of the government kingdom and guarantee certain rights to the people, citizens in it. A written instrument, a law embodying the rules of a political or social organization, which is the church or can be the church. All right, now let's go further. Morality, laws of Christ, morality, laws of Christ. This is what we're going to be talking about. So this is just the introduction. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures today. Uh, there won't be a lot of points, point one, point two on the screen, on the PowerPoint. However, I'm personally going to give you some revelation as we go into this, because I got to kind of set this thought up. I didn't really want to um, bombard it with a whole lot of points this time, because there's so much foundation of what I'm going to articulate. I'm literally going to show you the in, in the New Testament. Testament are in the new covenant, I'm going to show you the actual judicial laws, the, the judicial legislative laws we are to keep in the laws of Christ. Now, I've given you a lot of outline work. Contextually, I've talked a lot about the constitution of Christ. I've talked about the constitution uh, of the spirit. I've talked, I mean, I've talked about how the um, spirit of the law is in there. I've talked about the law of liberty. I've talked about the law of Christ. And so we're going to combine it all together because all of it's talking about the law of Christ, which we understand now is also natural laws or natural science. And so as we begin to understand this, I want to begin to walk this down now. This particular phase, we've done phase one, as we are in phase two now, we're going to begin to go into a deeper, more in-depth level. And so we're going to talk from a scientific base, a biological base, and we're going to even get into some philosophical uh, arguments um, as it pertains to psychology and the psychological premises of the laws of Christ. I want you to know before we go into this, and this is why I come, I really didn't want to give you a lot of points today. I just want to kind of give you scripture so contextually you can understand where this particular phase is going to become 
coming from as we go deeper into the thought of the image of the king or one could even say the image of um, the image is created through the law the image is created through the law as we go deeper into this i want to address one of the first laws in the mosaic law um, one of the first tenses, I'm sorry, in the Mosaic law that the law of Moses covered, which is morality or morals. So now I want to talk about the morality of the laws of Christ. Is there morality in the laws of Christ? Is there still morality still existing? Many people say, okay, we live by grace. We don't live by the law. And so the question on the table is, if we live by grace and not by the law, does morality still exist? And if it does, where is it found and discovered in the New Testament? Now, before we go into that, we have to understand what does it mean to have morality or what does it mean to have morals? Let's go over that. Now, here we go. Write this down. The rules of behavior in an individual citizen or a group, the personal conscience, the personal conscience that are not a part of the legislative law. So let me say this. You cannot legislate. Hear me now. You cannot legislate conscience. You cannot legislate conscience. So I cannot legislate into your conscience a a a. A, a rule of law. And I'm going to kind of go over some stuff today. And this is why I kind of want to do an introduction because I got a lot to say today. Uh, I want you to understand that you cannot legislate consciousness. Amen. Look at this. A system of guidelines for behavior, uh, for behavior modification and character. So morality deals with a system of guidelines, a system of guidelines for behavior modification and character. These guidelines are codified by, I mean, codified in a written form and legally enforced. In other words, the constitution now is, is the written document that now God enforces legally for us to keep the morality of the laws of Christ. Listen, look at this. Morality is synonymous with the commands of a spiritual law and natural laws, parentheses of Christ. Let me say that again. Morality is synonymous with the commands of a spiritual law and natural laws of Christ. So it's not just the spiritual law, but it's also the natural laws of Christ that morality in the law of Christ covers. Look at this. A set of universal rules that apply to every citizen. They're universal, so it doesn't matter. Black, white, uh, you know, it really don't matter. You know, male, female, it doesn't matter. All of the laws of Christ give us the morality and their universal rules. It doesn't matter who you are. Just think about it. The universal rules work and apply to every citizen of the kingdom of God. Look at this, a general rule of right living. Morality, the laws of Christ give us the general rule of living, the general, the general rule of right living, not just living, right living. Look at this, Char uh, characteristic, characteristic rules for a group of citizens conceived through universally having the sanction of the king's will and conscience. In other words, these laws that we're going to begin to cover in phase two on morality are going to help give us the characteristics. These laws help us give the proper characterization that is needed to be a citizen in the group. The conceptual kind of the conceptual ideology that we should have uh, that has been sanctioned by the king and his will and his very consciousness are embedded within the laws of Christ. In other words, morality is only defined by the will of the king and his consciousness, and we can only define your law abidingness according to the characteristics of the laws you keep. In other words, morality is only defined by your character based on how you keep the laws of Christ. 
Look at this. Um, okay, so of the king, of the king's will and conscience, of the nature, I mean, of the nature of man. I put that into parentheses for a reason. The nature of man. I really want to show you something profound today. The nature of man. Let that marinate on you. The nature of man. We're going to go with this. In, in the citizens and natural justice. So there is a natural justice in the citizens. It's inherent within the characteristics of the law. Lastly, the basic protection of rights is the dignity of the citizen. The basic protection of, of rights is the dignity of the citizens. It's the dignity of the citizens. All right, let's go deeper. Now, again, I'm only giving you scriptures because today we just need to kind of walk through some of this. All right. And I may not get to some of this. So let's go back to this real quick because I want I want to revisit this. Let's let's revisit this because there's some things that were said in this in this definition of morality that I want to address. The, now, this is the definition of morality as it pertains to the laws of Christ. All right. So or, or, or according to the laws of the Constitution. I want to cover a couple of things in here because some of that I won't be able to cover as we go through these next couple of slides. So let's address it now. The personal consciousness that uh, that are um, that are not a part of legislative law. See, it was never God's will for 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 law to be legislated within us. Let me say it this way. Write this down. Any law that is written is a law that is hard for citizens to obey. Let me say it this way. When you have to write law, it's because the law is not innately or automatically embedded in the framework or in the actual citizen. Let me say it this way. Whenever there is a written law, it is a clear sign that the law is not in the citizens. Let me say that again. Whenever there is a written law, it is a sign that the law is not in the citizens. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So this is something we have to understand very clearly, okay? These particular laws that govern within our lives are not necessarily uh, something that we begin to see inside of our humanity. And so unfortunately, we don't get a chance to actually see how this really functions and how this really flows. All right. So now let's go deeper to this. I, I, want, I, want, I want to read this a little bit further down here now. Uh, notice what it says here now. I want to address this. It says morality is synonymous with the command of a spiritual law and natural laws of Christ. Look at that again. Morality is synonymous with the commands of a spiritual law and, and natural laws of Christ. So morality directly aligns itself with spiritual and natural laws spiritual and natural law. So morality can be found in the law of the spirit. It can also be found in the natural laws as well. Um, the last thing I want to address is here, the nature of man. Think about this. What is man's original nature? And we're going to address this a little bit further today. What is, what is the nature of man? What is the nature of man? What is the nature of man? Okay, so as we begin to talk about the nature of man, what is that? All right. So now, let's go a little further into this. I just want to address that because, see, the nature of, see, whenever you talk, see, I always, when I always look at scripture, I always thought that nature just meant the thing that was embedded within us to do. Like, I never, I never looked at it in terms of uh, man's original nature. Man's original nature is not found in humanity. You, our nature is not in humanity. Okay, so if you look around us, what is the natural habitat for a squirrel? 
What's the natural habitat for a bird? It's in the air. The natural habitat for a squirrel is on the ground or in trees, okay? It's not flying. Uh, it, now they can glide. You got some squirrels that can glide, but they don't fly, okay? What is the natural habitat for a fish? It's in the water. Okay, I'm going somewhere. What's the natural habitat for a plane? It's in the air. Where's the natural habitat for a car? It's on the ground. What is the natural habitat for a man? It's in God. Let me go deeper. The natural habitat for a man is kingdom. So the further Satan can get you away from kingdom, the further he can get you away from your natural habitat. In other words, Outside of kingdom, man cannot flourish. Outside, outside of kingdom, a man does not live. You know what I'm saying? Outside the parameters of the kingdom, man cannot exist. All right? Yeah. Let's go further. Let's look at this. So, and, and that's that's important to know. Let's look at this. Image of God found in Christ's law. I'm saying it again. Image of God found in Christ's law. We're going to be talking about, as we begin to go over this, we're going to be talking about the practical application of Christ's law. The practical application of Christ's law. This is phase two to the, uh, to the actual sermon series, Image of the King. This is the second phase. And now we're going to get into the application component of what the actual Christ law is. And we're going to break down each one of the laws. You're going to want to stay tuned in this particular broadcast and in this particular um, phase, because I'm really going to make this Christ law very simple. Uh, it's going to be so simple. Your kids are going to be able to do it. I'm going to show you the laws that we, that are divine laws that all of us must do in regardless of race, in regardless of gender. If you are a citizen of the kingdom, you must keep these laws. Uh, if you're going to walk in righteousness or right stance with the government of heaven. Look at this. What is the nature of man? I just asked that question and we're going to articulate it here a little bit through scripture. So in Genesis 1 and 26 and also Genesis 5 and 2, we, we, we see the concept here very clearly. Look at what it says here. Then God said, let us make man in our what? image according to our what resemblance let me say it again then god said let us make man in our image according to our resemblance look at this let them watch this the male and female have dominion or kingdom watch this over over so now what is the nature of man well, the nature of man is God image or godly image and godly resemblance and kingdom. So three things define the nature of man. One, man, you can write this down. Man must be, man must have the image of God. Now, if you look at the word image, let's break it apart. This is just me just doing wordplay. Let's break it apart. I am a G E. Look at this. I am a G E. I'm age. I'm age. And this is really interesting because when you look into the New Testament, it says in Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses one through four, that it tells us specifically there that if we never grow up into the things of God, we will never receive what God has for us. Well, this is mighty ironic because you look at the word image, image literally means I'm age or I am grown. I am of age. So proper imagery in the law of God will bring us to a place of spiritual maturation whereby we become mature in the image of God, which we behold. Next, we understand this. We ought to resemble that image. Our job is to reflect and resemble the image of the scripture. Look at this. Let them have dominion over. So it's our assignment to have kingdom over. So if a man, if a man has, if a man doesn't have the image of God, which means he's not keeping the laws of God, because after man fell, remember I said after man fell, the only way to have the image of God was God gave us a written law. A written law actually is an indictment to our to our man nature or to the nature of man. 
Because when God made man, God put the law in our heart. When God took the law out of our hearts and had to give us a written law, then it meant then, then, then what it meant was man lost his divine essence because in our divinity, uh, the law was not kept in human hands or written by human men. The law is actually kept and met in our hearts. It's actually met in our nature. So if you take the, okay, so if you take lying, I was telling my wife this last night as I was going deeper into this revelation. If you take the law of lying, you crumble it up, and you stick it inside of you, what do you have now? You don't have a law governing you out here. That law governs you inside of you. Now, what happens to you? You now become a person who tells the truth. Because if there's no law, listen, where there is no law, there can be no sin. So if you take the law of lying out of the air, and you put the law inside the person, then that law takes away the capacity to lie, thereby making the conduit truthful. Mm. Mm. If you take the law, and we're gonna go over this more and more and more, this stuff is awesome to me, I think it's so cool. So think about every law that the Bible taught. Let's just go through the Ten Commandments, just a few of the Ten Commandments. Okay, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you take thou shalt have no other gods before me, you take it out in front of you, you take it out in front of you, you crumble it up, you put it on the inside of you. What does it mean? There is no capacity to have any other God because there's only one God. So what am I saying? I'm saying that every time you see a written law, it's a sign that the spirit of the law is not actually in the citizen. Okay, let me say it this way. When the Holy Ghost has to keep reinforcing and telling you what to do, what not to do, what to do, what not to do, it is a sign that the spirit of the law has not got in you. It's also a sign that you're truly not walking in a citizenship mentality. In other words, your mind has not been renewed to citizenship status. That's why you have to keep having the law told to you because you have not embodied the spirit of the law. Uh, I feel like talking to y'all now. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now, let's go deeper into this. Uh, look, look what it says here. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, but to fulfill. So Jesus is saying, and that scripture is wrong there, but Jesus is saying that he did not come to break the law, but he came to actually fulfill the law. This, that scripture is actually John 6 and 45. John 6 and 45 is where we find that at. So um, Jesus says, I did not, uh, um, do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Notice the key words there. Do not think that I came to destroy. We have many people who teach that Jesus came to destroy the law and he took away the law. That's not true. That's not true. Jesus said it. The law or the prophets. So the law or the prophets, he did not come to destroy that. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That word fulfill means to bring one dispensation to an end and start another one. It means to complete one and start another one. So he completed the Mosaic law, but in completing the one law, he also instituted a whole nother one. So what he, what he was saying was, I didn't come and take, I did not come to take away the Mosaic law. I came to give the spirit of the law back to the sons of God. So you can have the resemblance and the image so you can walk in dominion. Let's go on. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. This is a good one. This is good. Y'all better pay attention. Look at this. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day 
that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor the Lord. Um, for they um, for they shall all, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember, I will remember, I and their sins I remember no more. And their sins I remember no more. This is really, really, really powerful. Now let's go over this because let's kind of break this down a little bit. One, look at this. I will make a new covenant. So the old constitution, which is the con covenant. So the, the when I use the word constitution, um, I'm actually saying the constitutional covenant. God didn't just make a constitution, but he made a covenant. And now, what's the difference between that? A constitution is something that you can amend. There can be amendments to it. You can change it. There can be an arrangement. A covenant is a contractual agreement that cannot be broken nor altered nor changed. It can be upgraded, but it can't alter or change. So now, when I say constitutional covenant, what I'm literally saying is this. God gave us a set of rules and laws to adhere to. But he bound himself to the same laws he gave us that are natural laws to govern this world by. He bound himself to those same laws by covenant. So he so those are uh congreg um those are constitutional covenant laws. Okay, so the constitution is a constitutional covenant. Okay, the kingdom of God has a constitutional covenant. It's not just that God gave us a set of rules to adhere by. It also meant he gave us a constitution where he himself has bound himself and tied himself inextricably to that constitution as well. So that means God cannot even break the natural laws he has set in place. This is why I come when Adam and Eve sinned, God could not leave heaven and come to earth because if he did, then the covenant, and the constitutional covenant he has set into the parameters of this world would have been broken. So he binds and ties himself to the very constitution he gives us to adhere to. Next, we understand, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. So God is going to do something completely new, something completely fresh, and he's not going to do the same kind of constitution or the same covenant constitution that he did in the Old Testament. Look at this, my covenant, which they broke. So they broke it. Now, here's where it gets good. And I'm almost done, y'all. Just doing the introduction, they just doing the introduction. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I, and it says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then, then, then let's kind of break this down. I will put my law in their minds. It was always the heart of God for us never to have a written law, but an internal law. Because if we are kings, we are governed by the law that is internal, not the law that is external. That's why I come a lot of times when you have external law, you still have lawlessness because people do not and have not partaken of the spirit of the law. In other words, the law has not been made flesh. Just like the Bible says in John 1 and 14, and the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. The reason why, the reason why can we have lawbreakers and even Christians who don't keep the law of God is because the word of God, the law of God has not been embedded within them. In other words, they're not spending enough time in the word for the word to become flesh. When the word becomes flesh, you don't even need the written word because when the word becomes flesh, now you become the very word that you read. 
So in other words, I don't have to worry about you lying, cheating, stealing, and fornicating when the law was inside of you because the capacity to lie, cheat, and fornicate doesn't exist. Why? Because now you have put on the mind of Christ. You have now been transformed. That's why I says take off the old man. Put on. The new. You have put on the new man, and you have made no more provisions for the flesh. You now have the mind of Christ, and as a result, now that you have the mind of the Constitution. I don't need to give you a written law to obey because your mind will now keep you kept. Lord Jesus, I wish I had time. You can now keep yourself. Why? Because the law now that was inherent and recessive now begins to dominate. The law now begins to be kingdom in your life. And now as the law was kingdom in your life, that law will lead, it will direct, it will guide you into all truth. Because the law has came off of the pages and got into the heart of the man and got into the mind of the man. And now the man is the law, Jesus Christ. The man heart is the law. God is trying to get the law to become flesh in our life. And let me tell you this, you have not mastered citizenship until the law was flesh. You have not got to a point of citizenship until God, the Holy Spirit don't have to tell you not to cuss, but you don't have the capacity to cuss. Y'all know, you, you have not got to the law of citizenship. You have not truly walked in citizenship until when God, until the Holy Ghost will have to tell you not to smoke, not to drink, not to fornicate, but the capacity, the desire, the craving, the lust to want to do those things is no longer in your vocabulary. It's not even in your mindset. Oh, my, my, my. you have not got the citizenship until the Holy Ghost will have to tell you to read your Bible. It doesn't have to tell you to pray, but you do it automatically because the desire in you is so much to please the Father that now praying and fasting has become a law that governs your life. I could stop right there. I just, I just, I just feel myself and I'm, I'm on this plane, but I feel like landing right there. I just, I just feel like landing on right there. I'm telling you that when you begin to walk in the law that God wants to put inside your mind and your heart, you no longer need the Holy Ghost to tell you because now the word has been made flesh. <laughs> so let me say this as long as the holy ghost has to lead you into doing what's right the law you have not developed the spirit of the law let me say it this way as long as the holy ghost has to convict you to convince you to do what's right you are not a citizen of the kingdom yet you are a citizen in the kingdom but you're not walking in citizenship yet it's a clear sign you're not walking in citizenship yet, in citizenship yet because true citizens don't need to be governed by the Holy Spirit to do what's right. They just do what's right. You know why? Because the law is in me. Um, and the capacity, the capacity to sin is not there. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I'll say that. And this is not even in my notes. But I'm going to give it to you. Um. Make provision for the flesh. Go to Romans 13 and 14. Romans 13 and 14. We're going to look at this real quick. Romans 13 and 14. I was, I was getting this in my spirit last night, and this thing just, just inside of me, man. I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm overflowing this morning. That's why I'm all over the place. Look at this. Romans 13, 14. But, but. But, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, why? And make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Listen to me. It is possible to live without fleshly provision. In other words, it is possible to live not subjected to doing what the flesh commands and craves. So I'm saying to you that it's a place in the citizenship of God where I, where the flesh has no capacity in me to lead, direct, and guide me. I'm totally, completely yielded to the law of God. 
Just wanted to show you that. Now, look at what it says here. Let's go further. It says, uh, I will put my law in their minds and will and write it on their hearts. And I will. God, no, all stuff he said what he would do. He says, I'm going to put the law in your mind, in your heart. He says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Watch this. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. Actually, me teaching you uh, like this is a sign that the Holy Spirit can't. See, See, the problem is a lot of times people are saying the Holy Ghost is leading and the Holy Ghost is teaching them. But the truth of the matter is the Holy Ghost ain't teaching them because the Holy Ghost, is, if the revelation you're coming up with doesn't lead you back to kingdom design, doesn't lead you back to kingdom thought, then it's not the Holy Ghost leading you because the sign of the Holy Ghost is to keep you in remembrance of how to keep the constitutional covenant and how to operate as a citizen of God and a king of God over the kingdom that he has given you to govern, which is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, as long as the Holy Spirit, listen to me, as long as someone has to help teach you how to do certain things, and not saying we don't need the fivefold, but the job of the fivefold is to mature you until we come into the unity of kingdom thought, where no longer do you need an apostle to teach you because you so learn kingdom that now God himself is teaching you. The problem is we got people saying God has taught them and the revelation they're coming up with is not kingdom revelation. So you still need to be taught. And I don't care if you're a pastor. If the revelation you come up with after seeking God is still humanistic, it's still theological, hello, and it is not kingdom. It's not kingdom. And theology is good as long as theology leads you back to kingdom. But if theology takes you away from kingdom or causes you to combat with kingdom, then theology is not going to help you um, theology is not going to help you and you still need to be taught by somebody. You need to be taught until you understand the full revelation or until you understand the full basics of the kingdom of God. Amen. So there will always be a need for an apostolic voice because there's always going to be people who don't understand kingdom. And there are a lot of people who just, they're praying and seeking God to give them revelation on everything but the kingdom. I know because I've been one of them. <laughs> Let me go into this a little bit further. My time is almost gone, y'all. And every man, his brother saying, know the Lord, for they all, for they all, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, and for I mean, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sin. I will remember no more. Listen, God is saying, listen, man, I'm trying to tell y'all something. I, I Listen, people teaching you is not was never my design. My design was for me to teach you personally. But because you have not and because you don't have the law of the kingdom in you to keep you from doing what's wrong, and I have to put a new constitution in you, I'm going to put a new constitution in you by where the Holy Spirit through a man once you get done learning it through a man by way of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to get to a point where you don't need your neighbor to teach you how to keep the law because you'll be keeping yourself. All right. Here we go, y'all. I'm going to try to get through some, some of the rest of this. So John 6 and 45, I kind of went over that. Um, and I'll say it again. It is written in the, it, it is, I'm sorry, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. This is powerful. Look at that. And I'm going to clear this up next week. Be taught by God, everyone heard, learn from the father comes to me. So the people who have never set up under the father's teaching can't come to Christ. So if you haven't got up under this kingdom teaching, it's going to be really hard to come to Christ in your understanding. Now, I'm going to say this because I'm saying something here that's heavy, and some people are going to find this a little hard to believe. So jump to, uh, jump to Matthew 13, 
This may be my last passage. Matthew 13, verses 11 and 12. Matthew 13, 11 and 12. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whosoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is powerful. We're talking about kingdom. So Jesus is literally saying, the people who are seeking kingdom revelation, I'm going to give you more revelation. And then I'm going to take from the revelation of people who don't want to know kingdom. I'm going to take what little bit they understand and give it to you. Then he says to those, watch this, to those, whatever little you have, I'm going to take it from you. So to the person who has a, a revelation of kingdom in abundance, God says, I'm going to add to your abundance, abundance. Jesus, I'm going to give you more. So in other words, all these folks walk around talking about, I'm going to learn. I mean, I'm, I need to learn this. I mean, what's the move of God and God doing this? God doing that. Let me tell you something. If you're not seeking kingdom revelation, God is literally hiding kingdom from you. What little bit of kingdom you think you understand, God is taking it from you and giving it to somebody else. Do you hear what I'm saying? So I'm going to say this because this is really strong. That would mean that kingdom revelation is not for everybody, even though it's given, even though the access is for everybody, it's not given to everybody. Only those who seek after the kingdom revelation will get it. And those who don't want it, ain't trying to deal with it, don't want to be around it. God says, whatever little kingdom revelation you get, I'm going to snatch it from you and give it to the person who is seeking it. And I know this to be true. I've lived this. Amen. So. Look at this. As we're coming to our last little scripture here. It's found in Hebrews 10 and 2 and also 9 and 14. Hebrews 10 and 2 verses 9 and 14. We read out the New King James Version. Look at this. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. How much more shall the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. Cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. Let's cover this. Would have had no more consciousness of sin. So honestly, he wants to get you to a point where you're, you're no longer sin conscious, but you're kingdom conscious. In other words, your conscience has been cleansed. That's what it says there. He cleanses your conscience through the blood of Jesus so that in your conscious state, which is your natural state, God then is able to cause you to walk in the obedience of the kingdom. Now, listen to me. The consciousness of the law, and this is what we're going to cover next week. Um, and, and I'll stop right here for time's sake. I'll start right here for time's sake. See, see, the blood of Jesus cleanses our consciousness. The blood of Jesus cleanses our consciousness. Are you hearing me? It is the blood of Jesus that cleanses our consciousness. Because of what Jesus has done, our consciousness has been completely cleansed. And we have to begin to understand as we talk about the cleansing of our particular conscience that Jesus wants and God wants, to, wants us to know that the nature of man, I asked this question in the beginning, what is the nature of man? The nature of man is the image of God, the resemblance of God, and the kingdom of God. That is our nature. Our nature, our essence derives from kingdom. 
And it's in the kingdom of God that now we begin to understand how do we begin to operate as citizens of that kingdom? Well, it's really simple. We begin to operate as citizens of that particular kingdom as we begin to walk in obedience to what the king has established. And as the king begins to tell us what, what we should be walking into, what we should be walking into. And so we're able to reduplicate what we had in, um, in the Garden of Eden. We're able to reduplicate that through keeping, <coughs> excuse me, through keeping the laws of God, which, which creates the image of God. I'm going to go over this a little bit more. I know I said a lot today that was top heavy and I'm going, I'm going to work this out the next couple of weeks. Today was just the introduction into this particular series. I'm telling you, it's going to get powerful as we go along. You're going to want to invite people. You're going to want to share this. This is going to be something that's going to help you. Listen to me. I'm going to make this practical. I know we've been going over the kingdom of God. I know we've been covering how to walk in the image of God. And some of us don't even know what the heck that is. I'm going to make it so simple. You can apply it. Your three-year-old could apply this revelation. I'm going to make it that clear, okay? Because a lot of times we talk about the law of Christ. We talk about the law of God. Nobody knows what we're talking about. But I'm going to make it really clear as to what that law is and what that law looks like, all right? So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and I appreciate you so, so, so much. Um, as we continue to go deeper into this revelation, man, it's so much stuff, man, I, I want to cover, man. I want to show you. So many things um, as it pertains to the law of God, I mean, as it pertains to morality. I'm telling you that if you still need something to govern you, if you still need someone to tell you how to live right, how to act right, how to talk right, you are not operating at your optimal capacity as a king of God and as a citizen of the kingdom. You are walking beneath your purpose, beneath your privilege. Why? Because as long as I need someone to tell me to do right, I do not have the ability or I'm not walking in the capacity to do right inside of me, which means I'm not walking in right stance with God or righteousness. Um, as you look at the word righteousness as it pertains to what I'm talking about now, now you understand that righteousness is a condition of the heart and it is a disposition of the mind. So righteousness is a condition of the heart and it's a disposition of the mind or a position of the mind. So I'm right in my thoughts and I'm, I'm, I'm conditioned in my heart to do what is right. This is powerful, you all. And this is where we've been missing it at. I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of people have been missing it here because we keep trying to go to the Bible and do and do and do instead of just be. I'm going to say that again. You're supposed to read the word of God and meditate in the word of God. And the more you read, the more you meditate. Now, notice you're not saying nothing. You just read and meditate. The more you read, the more you meditate. The word is getting in your heart. And the word will keep you from sinning. How do we know? And I'm going to cover this as we go later into this teaching. But David said it this way. David said in the book of Psalms, he said, I have hidden the constitution. I have hidden the constitutional covenant. I have hidden the kingdom in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've taken the law that I've been reading and I've put it in my heart so that the law will keep me from sin. Lord, help me, G. And David said this without no Holy Ghost, without no shed blood. He said, I'm able to keep myself from sinning because I've taken the law and placed it in my heart. David said this after what he did with Bathsheba, and he is now saying, I now know what to do. I have taken the word, I have taken the constitution, put it in my heart so that I do not commit sin. And he said that without no Holy Ghost, he said that without one shed blood of Jesus, and yet we have a better covenant in the New Testament. Testament, and many of us are struggling not to sin, and yet we have at our disposal the law of God, and that law will keep us so we have to sin, so we don't have to sin anymore. Well, God bless you, and we thank you so much for tuning in today, and thank you so much for being here with us. This is the introduction to phase two. That's right. Phase two. We are shifting the corner. We, we've laid the foundation. We're about to come in and lay down all of the plumbing and the electrical wiring in the basement of our foundation so we can begin to build on top of that which we have gutted out. So everything up to this point, phase one was about us gutting and taking out the dirt. It was about making sure there was no leakage 
in the cement, as we begin to lay the cement out. Now, as we're continuing to build through this foundation, we're now going to get the carpenters, we're going to get the plumbers and the electricians, and we're now going to begin to build even in this foundation, this basement. We're now going to begin to build in, in, in this foundation everything that is needed for us to begin to build on top of that which we have already laid. Let no man preach anything or try to lay another foundation other than the foundation of the king and the kingdom. And so we're not trying to redo the kingdom teaching. We're just going back over and we're making it simplistic so that every person who is a recipient of this teaching is able to be totally transformed by the message. And so we thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and pray out. And when I'm done praying, I'm going to give some specific instructions as to what to do with those of you who want to give. So let us go before the Father, before the King of Kings in prayer. Papa, we thank you so much for this revelation. We thank you so much for this teaching. Thank you so much for guiding and leading and directing us. We ask you to continue to keep us in your art to say, continue to give us wisdom, insight, and advice. Father, we thank you for all of the things you've already done, the things that you have spoken and manifested in our lives. Thank you for all of it. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen.